The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Is the Ukraine-Russia war a proxy world war? Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov says it is. He contends NATO is using Ukraine as a battering ram against the Russian state. Lavrov says Russia is the target of one of the most ruthless proxy wars in modern history. U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin in a Washington Post article confirmed America's goal is to weaken Russia, saying the only way to deal with a rogue regime is to reduce its capacity for harm. See Anthony Pfaff, a senior fellow of the Atlantic Council, wrote, with Russia already believing the war is effectively a battle against the West and NATO, there is the possibility that a potential Russian defeat could motivate Putin to expand the conflict by attacking NATO countries. We're more than six months into the conflict and Russian casualties continue to mount and the impact of the war is being felt in countries around the world. Cut off from normal trade, Russia has now turned to another pariah state, North Korea, for weapons. This, in addition to the recent purchase of Iranian drones, shows that sanctions are hurting Moscow. And as a member of the Security Council of the UN, the question remains, will the purchase of weapons from North Korea jeopardize Russia's status? Will the Russian invasion of Ukraine escalate from a proxy war to a world war or is it already a global conflict? I invited Jeffrey Simpson to join me for a conversation that matters about the expanding risks associated with Putin's determination to reclaim the Soviet empire. Jeffrey, welcome. Thank you for having me. Good to have you back. Um, how do you classify where we're at in this conflict um, between Russia and Ukraine? Has it truly expanded out to a point where virtually every country around the world is in some way feeling the impact of the reaction to and the actions on the ground? Yes, I think that's, well, I wouldn't say every country in the world, but certainly a large number of them, whether it's because of food supplies, right? whether it's because of refugees from Ukraine that have been flooding into Eastern Europe and then heading in some cases to North America, um, whether it's the price of oil, which has destabilized uh, economies. Some have benefited from it, like China and India, because they're buying Russian oil at lower prices because Russia has to get, has to get rid of it. You mentioned North Korea. Um, <laughs> you know, you can tell somebody by their friends, right? in life and in politics. And when you're uh, getting weapons, as is reported from North Korea and drones from Iran, um, you're in pretty unsavory company. If, if, those are the, if those are the countries that you're relying on to supply you with weapons for this war, it's kind of a, an unsavory trilogy. So yes, the war is having a, uh, an effect uh, in many places in the world. The effects haven't yet played themselves out because the winter is coming in Europe and also the food limitations in various countries will continue to be present with possibly destabilizing impacts on governments that can't feed their people in the Middle East or in Africa. So the reverberations of the war are bid fair to go on for, well, a very considerable period of time. Do you believe that this current situation has uh, the capacity to expand as far as armed conflict is concerned? Will Putin feel cornered and then lash out? Well, the question would be lash out at whom? Um, if you listen to his propagandist in chief, uh, Mr. Lavrov, this is a Western inspired attempt to weaken and diminish Russia and therefore the war is actually aimed at Russia, and therefore Russia is uh, within its rights, he would put it this way, to respond in whatever ways it sees fit. Uh, clearly, if Russia is losing the war in due course, they might be inclined to increase the um, stakes, if I can put it that way. I don't think there's any chance of them invading NATO countries. NATO countries 
have clearly been supporting Ukraine militarily, politically, but they have been very careful not to send any troops or any weapons over the so over the Russian border. So if the Russians were to make some strike against uh, NATO countries or a NATO country, justifying it on the grounds that NATO was trying to do in Russia, there's no evidence of that. What NATO is trying to do is to make life difficult for Russia in a war that Russia started. Uh, there's a school of thought in certain quarters in the United States and in intellectual circles that this war is actually Ukraine's fault, that Ukraine should have made concessions after 2014. It should have accepted the annexation of Crimea as a fait accompli. It should have not removed Russian, which is true, Russian language guarantees in the eastern part of the country and that they are the ones that actually provoked the Russians. This is a distortion of history. Uh, the Russians did not have to invade Ukraine. Ukraine was not a member of NATO. It was not going to become a member of NATO for a long, long time. That had been signaled to the Russians by the French and the Germans. And also in terms of the European Union, it was going to be a long time before Ukraine would ever join the European Union because its economy and its civil society just wasn't ready. I give you the example of Turkey. Turkey, some decades ago now, uh, asked for the ability to begin to negotiate accession to the European Union. And the European Union kind of led them on and said, oh yes, by all means, but behind the corridor, behind the curtain in the corridor, the French and the Germans and the others, that's a country that is not compatible with our values or with our political et cetera, et cetera. So the Russians had to know that the likelihood of Ukraine joining NATO or the European market, European Union rather, were uh, very distant, let's put it that way. I got to get you to hang on for a second while we take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Did Putin just simply miscalculate what the response would be? Because, you know, you point to when he uh, moved in on Crimea in 2014, there was very little response from the West. Did he feel that he was going to be able to just, um, uh, in essence, declare to the Ukrainians that he was taking their, their country and uh, therefore um, that they would roll over? Um, and in doing so, uh, as I understand from his perspective, he didn't even call this a war. He still doesn't call it a war. No. So what you've just asked is a fundamentally important question. What were the motivations um, behind this? And as sometimes happens in war, there was a substantial misreading on the part of the country that launched the war, in this case, Russia. Now, let me just go back in history a bit. You can read in the speeches that Mr. Putin has given and in the written documents that he's produced, which make for a rather fascinating reading, actually, that he doesn't consider and never has considered Ukraine to be a real standalone sovereign country. That Ukraine was always part of the greater Russian Rus, uh, the greater Russian heartland. They would actually say, if you go back far enough in history, that the Rus that became Russia actually started in Kiev. And Mr. Putin makes reference to the Battle of Petlova, which occurred between Russia and the Swedish Empire under Charles. I forget which Charles. I'm sorry, we've got Charles III now here. Um, and he was a great conqueror, Charles III, but he made the mistake of resting in Ukraine to feed his troops, and the Russians counterattacked and defeated him. And this was on what is now Ukrainian soil. And he's made reference to that as if to say, you know, it's now Ukrainian soil, but really it was our soil, Russia, when we won this great victory against the Swedes hundreds of years ago. So in his mind, our, Ukraine is a kind of artificial political construction that became part of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics, the demise of which he's called the greatest catastrophe of the last century. And what he means in part by that is that the disintegration of the Soviet Union left a number of Russian speakers outside the boundaries of Russia in 
the stands in Central Asia, down in the <clears throat> Azerbaijan, Armenian, Georgian area, uh, in parts of Moldova, and of course in Ukraine, and that all of these linguistic entities rightfully are part of Mother Russia, Holy Russia. And the fact that they declare themselves to be independent is artificial. And this is the justification in his own mind as to why he's never uh, given to Ukraine what we might call agency, that is to say, the capacity to make up its own mind about what it wants to do, where it wants to orient itself politically and economically. He, he doesn't, that, that, that's like saying some part of Russian heartland <clears throat> is doing something against the interests of greater Russia. And this is, in his view, a fundamental misreading by the West. We think it's a fundamental misreading by him. And uh, I think that's at the core of his sense of uh, what is truly Russian. And Ukraine, he thinks, is truly Russian, that somehow got away because the West fomented an uprising in Ukraine against uh, Russian-oriented political leaders, and that this is all part of a wider Western <clears throat> plot to destabilize Russia. And he would, he would link this back to the uh, demonstrations that occurred against him soon after he became president, which he has always said were fomented by Hillary Clinton and the CIA and the West. So he's right from the time, that, and don't forget, he was a KGB agent. I mean, he's, he's had this view of the world and of Russia and of the West. He was trained in this view, and I don't think he's fundamentally ever gotten out of that way of seeing Russia and the world. This is our second break. We'll be back in a moment. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Former Vice Admiral of U.S. Navy John Stuffelbeam, in a conversation that I had with him, uh, believed that uh, Putin had this sense that he was going to be able to draw together Iran, North Korea, China, and even India to work with Russia to try and diminish uh, the influence of American power around the world. Is he being successful at all, or is it just backfiring on him? Uh, good question. It's a really a judgment answer. Um, well, if, as I said before, if your friends are North Korea and Iran, um, you know, they're not exactly countries that the rest of the world thinks very highly of. As for the, the more interesting relationship is with China, because the Chinese have tried to play their cards very carefully here. They haven't committed any weapons, unlike the North Koreans and the Iranians, to the Russians that we know of. I mean, maybe there's stuff going on illicitly that we don't know about. But I suspect the Chinese would know that the Americans would find out about that pretty soon. And that that might risk uh, economic retaliation against the Chinese economy, which is for them the sine qua non of the Communist Party's existence, <clears throat> that in the defense of their territory. So Russia has now essentially turned its back on the West and is looking and turning to the East. Mr. Putin was recently at a conference in Vladivostok in which he talked just in those terms that it's now the East. Uh, and the, the, the fact of the matter is, now this is an overstatement, Russia is going to become a gas station for China. Russia doesn't make anything. Name me one product that Russia makes that the Chinese want to buy. Anything in high technology, any cars, any clean technology, nothing. They make fur hats, but the Chinese make fur hats too. So they're going to be dependent upon the Chinese for most of the high technology, many of the manufactured goods, some of which came from Germany and now will come from China. Uh, so they've made themselves an economic uh, second tier state to the Chinese. And that's the price you have paid for turning your back against the West. It's my understanding <clears throat> that Putin will not declare the uh, invasion of Ukraine as a war because he does not want to uh, initiate uh, mandatory conscription. 
um, because he believes that to do so would be detrimental to his uh, popularity and position within the country. How then does this weaken his ability to resupply his frontline forces? Well, I think the only plausible explanation for the lack of mobilization, Stuart, is the one you just gave. I think he's afraid, it's curious in an authoritarian state, he's afraid of the reaction of public opinion. He may remember, because he was around at the time, <clears throat> the reaction in the Soviet Union to the deaths of soldiers in Afghanistan. You know, after a while, Americans said, what the hell are we fighting in Vietnam for? I mean, it's far away. What are we doing here? And Afghanistan from Moscow was like a whole other world of people who thought differently, dressed differently, different religion. What the hell are we doing in there? And the Afghans, as you know, aided by the CIA, uh, the Mujahideen put up a tremendous guerrilla warfare against the Russians and they eventually left. And that war was very unpopular. There were a lot of body bags that came back. So I think he's got that in his mind and is saying, you know, we've already lost untold tens of thousands of soldiers wounded or dead. And mobilization would raise the level of conflict quite a lot and bring the war into the homes of people all across Russia. And he obviously is very concerned about what the effect of that might be on what we might loosely call public attitudes. I won't call it public opinion. So I think that's the only plausible explanation. And that's why he's been asking for volunteers from Chechnya and from Syria, taking arms from North Korea, offering all kinds of inducements for young people to sign up, bonuses, job guarantees, et cetera, et cetera. So he's trying to do that. The, the problem with that, there are many problems, and I'm not a military expert by any stretch of the imagination, but you're trying to train up young people who've signed up in a very short period of time. We saw that when they went into Kiev, or tried to. And the soldiers who were captured or killed were kids who hadn't had very much training because he thought the Ukrainians were going to wrap their arms around the Russians and welcome them as their, as their cousins. And the more you put largely untrained soldiers into the battlefield with sophisticated weapons, um, the less effective that force is likely to be because they simply get into vulnerable positions. So I think he's in a bit of a box in terms of the ground forces that uh, he has. Numbers he has. Numbers he has. Quality? Not so sure. Well, it's my understanding that at the time of our recording here, the estimates on Russian casualties could be anywhere between 60 and 80,000. That's not everyone has died, but they've been injured and are, are no longer uh, eligible or available to be involved in armed conflict. The big challenge for Putin is then how does he refill those uh, frontline requirements without completely diminishing the rest of his army. So what has this done to the Russian army in effect and the impression of what the uh, lethality of the Russian army might be? Well, the lethality of the Russian forces, let's put it that way, remains pretty high. They still have great artillery capacity. They still have air force capacity. They still, they're bringing in drones, but they have their own. I mean, from an equipment point of view, they may not be quite up to Western standards, but they've got a lot of equipment. In terms of soldiers, well, we were just discussing the fact that they're relying now on more young, lightly trained soldiers to go into combat. Uh, remember, too, that the war is largely being fought on Ukrainian territory, and the Ukrainians know the territory quite well by one means or another. And they have considerable intelligence from the United States in terms of the eyes in the sky that the Americans have, including the drones that they themselves have now, um, in, in, in terms of human intelligence. Uh, I mean, they, they, I'm again, no military expert and I'm not a correspondent over there. I'm only regurgitating what I've read from people in my respect. The Ukrainians are fighting terrain that, in <clears throat> terrain they know they're fighting for their homeland. 
they have figured out that frontal attacks and assaults on Russia is not really going to do it for them. So they've been pinpricking the Russians, if I can put it that way, and the new weapons they're getting, which allow them to propel uh, missiles well behind Russian lines and blow up their uh, weapons depots and their command systems is having an effect. So they're, they're, they're acting in an extremely intelligent military way, it seems to me, vis-a-vis -vis Russia, given the disproportionate number of boots on the ground that the Russians have. Third and final break. We'll be right back. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. So based on our conversation at this point, how would you summarize what you believe are the risks going forward? Will this escalate or is it now fairly well contained and moving towards some uncertain conclusion at this point? Do we, you know, risk expansion or are we going to be witnessing um, more of the same? Well, the one part of the one expansion we're not going to see is Ukrainians invading Russia, even if they could. That's one expansion that isn't going to happen. It's not like a situation where there's a sovereign line between two countries and the war goes back and forth. That's not going to happen. The Ukrainians have neither the <clears throat> forces nor the intention to do that. And NATO wouldn't let Ukrainian do it, Ukraine do it, frankly. So that's one expansion isn't going to happen. Could the level of violence go up? Yes. Um, you know, the Russians still have, uh, you know, lots of stocks of weapons and planes and they've got these new recruits and they could just throw more and more fodder into the battles and try and push the Ukrainians back. So that's possible. As I said before, I don't see any circumstances under which Russia would invade a NATO country and therefore activate the article of the alliance that causes all countries to come to the aid of a member country if attacked. Uh, you know, that, that would be crazy from Russia's point of view. So I think we're in a situation where, and we've seen this in wars before, where neither side can win, but neither side for the moment, but neither side can afford to lose. I mean, Ukraine can't afford to lose because it would mean the dismemberment of um, a big chunk of their territory and a great weakening of their ability in the future to function as a sovereign state. They'd be cut off from their ports. They would have lost Crimea. They would have lost some of their agricultural capacity. Uh, if, you, if, if you just l leave the Russians in charge of where they are right now, that would be a loss for the Ukrainians. Not as bad a loss as if the whole country had been overtaken by the Russians, but it nevertheless would be a big loss. The Russians would lose, not because they're gonna lose any of their territory, because I personally don't think the Ukrainians have the military capacity to go back into Crimea. But they would lose in the sense of they started this with a series of objectives, few of which have thus far been realized. And they would have expanded, expended rather, large amounts of money and men uh, to try to achieve an objective that they really haven't achieved. And they will have suffered over time from the sanctions that will have been imposed upon them. And NATO will have been strengthened by the addition of two excellent countries. So they, they can't afford to lose in that sense. So defining what constitutes victory, as uh, Walensky keeps saying in Russia, it's the recap in Ukraine rather, it's the recapturing of all the territory we've lost to the Russians. Militarily, do they have the capacity to do that? I. I'm pretty dubious. Um, on the other hand, the Russians aren't going to take Kiev or Kharkiv, I don't think. And they're going to be left with a simmering brew of discontent in the occupied areas. And that's not a very appetizing long-term forecast for them. So unless one side or the other makes a significant military breakthrough and therefore may destabilize the local government, I mean, if the Russians were to make a substantial breakthrough into the Ukrainian heartland, maybe Ukrainians would say, we need a new leader. I, I don't know. It's hard to imagine that happening in Russia because there's no outlet for dissent, public dissent. It would have to be a palace coup. And um, that's a lot easier to talk about than to actually do when the leader controls the security services, the armed forces, 
the civil service and all the media of communication. It's not an easy thing to do. As we've worked our way through this conversation, I go back to my uh, earlier question, is this a global, global conflict? And it, well, it may have been initially because of the interconnectedness between Russian and uh, European economies and uh, other supply chains, but we're quickly responding. Uh, and on this side of the uh, Ukraine-Russian border, uh, we're making those adjustments and there may be a hard winter ahead, but in the long term there could be a very hard decade or two ahead for the Russians because of this decision. Well, I think this is a really, and this has been said by many people, this is a real turning point in the post-war history of Europe and to some extent the world. Uh, the Europeans, principally the Germans, after the collapse of the wall, <clears throat> felt very... Uh, how would I put it, uh, grateful to the Russians for having allowed German unification. The Russians could have stopped it, I mean, with some difficulty, but they could have thrown up all kinds of obstacles, and in fact, they didn't. So in the immediate post-war period in Germany, there was a very pro-Russian sentiment. And then when Russia had some elections, that heightened the expectation that, you know, maybe the Russians were going to throw off hundreds of years of authoritarian ways of thinking about the world. And we're going to become a kind of partner with the West and German industry and European industry flowed into Russia and made many investments and jobs were created and Western tech firms went in there and it seemed to be a brand new world. And this was a bipartisan matter in Germany. I mean, Ger Gerhard Schröder, who was a social Democrat chancellor, he was very, very strong on this. In fact, subsequently went on the board of Gazprom and went to see Putin many times. Angela Merkel, you know, people said Angela Merkel grew up in East Germany. She speaks fluent Russian. She knows the Russians. We can trust her because the Russians are actually wanting to do business. Put the politics aside. They want to do business. And all of that has collapsed. And Germany does not see Russia in any way, shape or form as it did for several decades after the Berlin Wall came down nor do other European countries. Um, and so I don't think Western countries are going to trust Russia for a very long period of time and vice versa, not that the Russians ever trusted us very much. So I think the geopolitics of the world are going to shift quite a bit as China and Russia try to work something out in an anti-Western way. And Russia tries to recoup from the economic losses that they will suffer as a consequence of the war and the sanctions. And we have to uh, think about our own economies, particularly with regard to energy uh, over the next uh, five or 10 years. Just a final comment. I mean, the clean energy revolution, if I can put it that way, is on everybody's mind, whether it's solar or whether it's green hydrogen or whether it's uh, wind turbines or whether it's hydro or nuclear, I mean, all these fossil, fossil, fossil fuel free sources are very much in the news. But it's going to take a long time to um, produce enough energy from those sources, some of which are yet unproven, like green hydrogen, some of which I was reading a book by the great Vasilov Schmiel from the University of Manitoba the other day is a bit of a contrarian. Mm -hmm. But he was pointing out that in Germany, because they're a, a country with gray skies, um, and solar panels only produce energy 12% of the time with any significance. And in Germany right now, uh, they want to expand wind power in the northern seas of Germany and in the northern parts of the country. And there's great opposition in the south to the transmission lines going through Bavaria and Baden-Württemberg by the premiers who don't want these ugly transmission lines. So the shortest distance between two points in clean energy is not often a straight line. And the distance and time it takes to get from A to B is much longer than anybody at the moment realizes. So there's going to be a transition, but it's going to probably be longer and more difficult than most people who talk rather blithely about it understand. I did an interview with uh a fellow a couple of years ago who said, uh, you have to remember it took 
more than 50 years to transition from the horse to the automobile as the main source of transportation in North America because of the infrastructure needs that are required to make this happen. And at the time, you didn't have a uh, working model like the automobile standing in the way. Just, I, I agree with you, it's gonna be a long transition. I, you know, some years ago, I wrote one of my many instant rare books with Mark Jacquard from Simon Fraser about climate change. It was a, a primer more than anything else. And the long and the short of it is I got invited to a number of, uh, to give a number of talks about climate change. This was just coming onto the public consciousness. But what kind of, uh, I won't say scared me or disillusioned me because I'd seen it before, was that the activists on this file were totally passionate and committed, but they were also very misunderstanding, either willfully or whatever, of the complications of this transition. Their arguments seemed to be, as if there was just enough political will, if the leaders just had enough political will, we could get this transition done, underway and done pretty, pretty quickly. And I just sat up there and listened to this and I said, you know, I just don't think that's right. This is an extremely complicated matter. Technologically, we don't have all the answers. Culturally, we're not there. The infrastructure of the country is based on fossil fuels in manufacturing and generating power for cars and industry. It's going to take a very long time to get this transition done. People didn't want to hear that. There's no, 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 we just had the will. And I think we're still just at the beginning of the transition, which will take uh, some decades, I regret to say. I'd like it to take place faster. But, uh, and the other thing is, since we're talking about Russia and China, countries in Europe, to a lesser extent, North America, are trying to make this transition happen. The Chinese are too, but they don't anticipate real progress until 2050, 2060, because they're gonna continue to burn lots of coal. And Russia's doing nothing, zero about this issue. And they're one of the world's biggest exporters of coal and natural gas. So um, we can we we in Canada are what one and a half two percent of total emissions. If we could cut it and cut them in half, we'd reduce total world emissions by 0.75 or one percent. Meanwhile, the Russians are, you know, sending gas and oil to China and to India and God knows where else. And the Iranians are pumping everything they can because they're under sanctions and they need every petrol dollar they can get, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that this this I regret to say is going to be a long, difficult exercise. <clears throat> and the only good thing I can say about this is war is that it has had the effect of two things. It has enjoined countries to realize how uh, vulnerable they are, depending upon their circumstances, to unpredictable sources of, uh, of carbon making fuels. In this case, far too dependent on Russia, but it could be far too dependent on the Middle East, which is an unstable part of the world, as we know. So that, I think, has had a salutary effect. And secondly, to the extent that the prices have gone up and that supplies have been restricted, it does push, causes an economic push, a political push, even a cultural push towards more green energy. In other words, there'll be an acceleration of these different sources I was just talking about because the fossil fuel sources will be either more expensive or more difficult to get at. I agree with you. Um, and most importantly, I want to say thank you for your time today and your insights. Well, thank you very much. I'm sorry I couldn't predict how this war will end, but uh, <clears throat> um, I, 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 I think when we talked before, and I'll just repeat, repeat what I made, a point I made, <clears throat> the more I see this, the more I see Russian history in its modern iteration of a combination of authoritarian government that goes back to the czars, propped up by a sense of the mission of Russia towards Russian speakers, uh, supported by the military and the secret service, because the czars had those and so did the, so the Soviets, and the Orthodox Church, and the big businessmen. That, that has been the combination that has supported authoritarian rule in Russia going back hundreds of years. It was a very brief period 
before the Bolsheviks took over where the Mensheviks wanted to introduce more democracy. There was a brief period after the fall of the Soviet Union, but the old instincts of Russia and the sense of being put upon by the West, uh, these instincts are uh, exceptionally deep in the Russian mentality and they are very much driving, I think, what is happening out of Moscow today. Yes, I agree. Thank you. Okay, nice to talk to you again. And, and likewise. Bye for now.